The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Above our heads, a myriad of airplanes trace their contrail patterns in the sky. Beyond them and the stratosphere, countless satellites ride their fixed orbits. We have conquered the air. We are reaching towards space. But on a globe, four-fifths of which is covered by water, beneath the surface of the restless sea lies the real unknown. This story will take us there. I've made up my mind, Steve. It's up to you to decide. What's to decide? Count me in, Mr. Hunter. That's what I need to hear. Oh, one more thing. The name is J.C. Partners. Can't be strangers. We live through this one, we won't be. Anything this big, one way or another, none of us will ever be quite the same. mystery drama, Raptures of the Deep, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Tolan. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Grease stain, oil stain, mud stain, and chocolate. When you want to talk stain out, shout it out. Now you can prove shout's a mom's best friend. Before washing, just spray it on a tough stain. Wait a few seconds. Turn over the fabric and see how Shout penetrates right through to the other side. That's right. Shout saturates, really penetrates. It's almost like spraying both sides of the stain at the same time. So when you want a tough stain, I'll shout it out. I like pickles, but they don't like me. Send your stomach some dry kill. I like pizza, but it doesn't like me. Send your stomach some dry kill. Digel's special combination of antacid and anti-gas ingredients gives you fast, gentle relief from acid indigestion, heartburn, and gas in just minutes. I like hot dogs, but they don't like me. Send your stomach some dry kill. For occasional use, only as directed. There is a vast difference between the mysteries of the sea and those of the infinite space beyond the envelope of air that surrounds us. In space, man must cover vast distances by machine to delve into the unknown. Under the sea, machines can travel and observe, but there is so much terrain, so much life, and movement is so limited that eventually only man himself, unencumbered, is the ultimate explorer. The diver, and in particular, that special breed of men, the scuba divers. Hey, Cobb, you old son of a gun, the Marines have landed. Get your butt off that helicopter and report for duty. Where's your gear? Johnny, the pilot's going to dig it out for me. It's stowed in the tail. There's no time. This is a big one. You can dig out your own gear. I'll help you with it. I got a car waiting, and I'm driving you straight to the Pandora. The what? Pandora. That's the name of J. Calvin Hunter's ship. <laughs> ship? You can decide if you want to call her a boat when you see her. By me, the Pandora's a ship. The dame who opened up the box and let all hell loose. That's her. Well, why would he want to call his yacht that? Better ask him. <laughs> I don't know. It smells like trouble. When have you and me ever got into anything else? This one. We'll never forget. The name is Steve Carr, but it didn't start out that way. The real name, the ethnic one, is Stephanos Karalis. Both my mom and dad are from Greece, and I still speak Greek as well as I do English. Me and Cobb Straker were in the Navy together, frogmen. And after we got out, we went into the salvage business. What I mean is, we handled a lot of jobs, but only on the number one jobs did we work together. Matter of fact, we hadn't seen each other in six months. I'd been working on some offshore oil rigs around Galveston, while Cobb had been keeping a finger on the pulse of what we really care about. Buried treasure. He stayed with the firm's base in Freeport, Bahamas. 
We had a lot to catch up on in the car. So Galveston worked out? Yeah, finally. What happened to your cake? Oh, we found the Estralita okay in about 40 fathoms. And? Just the ribs. And pretty well broken up. The keel was still there and enough of a stern to identify her. Two cannons, one eaten away so badly it was scarcely worth raising. The other in fair condition. But the treasure? Who knows, buddy boy? You fish around the Bahamas, the Caribbean. A lot of folks might have been there first. Or storms, drifting tides, or maybe she didn't have gold aboard in the first place. Well, the hazards of our business. So tell me about this uh, prize pigeon. J. Calvin Hunter? No. Why not? Because I want you to set the setup and listen to him yourself. This could be big, Steve. Really big. Or just so much hogwash. I want to let you judge that for yourself. We hadn't far to go to the wharf where the Pandora was moored. Cobb was right. This was a ship in every sense of the word. She was almost 200 feet overall, beamy, and for sure well over 2,000 tons. One glance at her silhouette told me she had every kind of device to handle deep diving and the equipment to go with it. I felt a tingling anticipation. I could sniff an explosive future. We parked the wagon and unloaded my gear. Mr. Hunter was waiting for us on the fantail. He was taller even than Cobb, but thin, all whipcord and steel. He had eyes like bullets that shot out from under heavy, dark eyebrows. Hmm, you made good time. Uh, this is Steve Cobb, Mr. Hunter. He's almost as big as you are, Cobb. Not uh, quite, sir. How do you do? Mm-hmm. Welcome aboard the Pandora, sir. <laughs> sit down, sit down. Well, now, did Cobb brief you on what all this is about? No, sir. He, uh, he wanted to let you tell me yourself. Mm, so you could make up your mind whether or not I was a nut or not, hmm? I didn't say that, sir. <laughs> no, I did. And I'll lay you a hundred to one. Cobb did also. It's a beautiful ship, Mr. Hunter. Well, it ought to be. Cost enough. Uh, but it's going to pay for itself one of these days. Why do you call it the Pandora? <laughs> because once I decided to have her rebuilt, I really opened up a can of worms. Cost me ten times the original estimate before it was finished. A regular Pandora's box of troubles let loose. I was beginning to think she was jinxed. Then why saddle her with the name? It suited my whim. Besides, after Pandora opened the box, all the evils and bad luck were let loose on the world. Do you know the one thing that was left? No, sir. Hope. According to some versions of the legend. So, that's good enough for me. We're going to need a lot of it where we're going. Just where is that, sir? I'll make it short and sweet. In 1663, April of that year, the Spanish sent out a convoy guarded by their heavier ships of war bound for Spain. While it was carrying some valuable cargo, it was merely a decoy, as all the supposed merchant ships were heavily armed. To decoy the British into attacking? Right. A decoy for what, sir? First off, to try to lure enough British and French privateers into destruction and clear the seas. And second, to draw away attention from a real prize. Right, Steve. The Alhambra. A colossus of a merchant ship that they had built, which was loaded to the waterline with gold, silver, and precious jewels. The value, even then, was in the millions. Today, it could at least run to half a billion, and perhaps more. They sent her out alone? No, 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 no. She was convoyed by two smaller men of war, and she took a different route. But either the British and French weren't fooled, or enough of them were smart enough to smell a rat. No, ah, they were fooled, most of them. But not three heavily gunned British privateers who were lying in wait for them. The weather was lucky for the British. They came out of a fog bank and sank the first man of war without taking a broadside in return. Then they turned their attention to the second. And with a bit more trouble, sank her. But when they turned to take their prize, they had a blow. 
She'd slipped away in the fog? No, 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 no. She was too big and lumbering to elude them. So instead, the captain, following his sealed orders, commanded everyone into the boats and lit a fuse to gunpowder charges that had been set for just such an eventuality. He blew his ship out of the water? Not quite. He blew the keel and half the bottom out of her, and she foundered and sank like a stone. Huh. Right off the coast here somewhere. <laughs> That's my secret. I have a lot of them. Because I have to be careful, gentlemen. And my captain, for example, has his coordinates. He knows where to sail, but not why. You boys know why, but not where. And nobody but us three knows what I'm after. How do you know all this, Mr. Hunter? Hmm. Money. Beg pardon? It buys a lot of information. A little here, a little there. Till finally, I could put it all together. But how can you be sure the information is legit? The captain of one of the British ships was one of my more colorful ancestors. He kept a very full and detailed log, which has been preserved as a family curiosity for the ten generations since it was written. You know where the ship went down? Exactly. Three hundred years ago. And at what depth? Uh, that I don't know. With luck, it could be one side or the other of the trough. Which trough? Uh, that would be... The start of telling, wouldn't it? Until I know you're committed. Well, what do you say, buddy? Heard enough? No. How do we split? And that's simple. Since I'm paying you your regular salvage rates, I carry all the financial risks. But I'm not greedy. Sixty percent for me. You split the other forty as you will. And if there's anything to split... That's very generous, Mr. Hunter. Well, it's worth it for the very best. Ah, the tide is turning. We should sail with it, if we can. Have you heard enough to decide? Well, I've made up my mind. Up to you, Steve. What's to decide? Count me in, Mr. Hunter. Hmm, that's all I need to hear. Oh, one more thing. The name is J.C. Partners can't be strangers. Steve. Yeah? You know where we are? Well, I can look at the sun. I don't have instruments. Roughly the eastern Atlantic, not too far south. Yeah, but where are we headed? <laughs> the man told you. His secret. Well, we're the ones have to dive. You said it. How deep? You mean free or with heavy equipment? If we're going to explore, you know it has to be free. How deep can you go? What's the record? 400-something feet? You can't work there. What's the problem? Like, right now, I think we're over the eastern trough. What, 4,000 meters, maybe three miles. You want to dive that? He's got that little bathysphere we're lugging. That's for observation, a gimmick. You can't salvage anything with that. You know what I'm thinking he's counting on? The Atlantic Ridge? Check. The Azores, the Canary Islands, something like that where the ocean bottom is within reach. Wherever that is. Maybe we'll turn up the lost continent of Atlantis or something. <laughs> Who knows? Well, it's worth a whirl. At these prices, any day. What have we got to lose? Hold it. What's that? They cut the engines. We had dropped anchor in 25 fathoms. That's a long way down. Six feet to a fathom, 150 feet. Everyone was out on deck when we got there. It was just at sunrise, maybe 4.20 in the morning. J.C. signaled us. He wanted us down in his quarters. There was coffee there and a large chart on a table marked out in a grid. He pointed to a dot in the middle. This is our position right here. You and Cobb will take sectors and scout them. We'll use marker boys to indicate what has been searched. Blue. With the red one, in case we turn up what we're looking for. Now, when do we start? How about this morning? Hmm. Just what I wanted to hear. Shoot up. Let's get going. You going over with us, J.C.? No, no. I'm a little old for these depths. Oh, maybe we all are. Now, look. 
We have a decompression chamber. I want you to take the least amount of time on the bottom that's safe. If it's too deep, we'll helmet you and, and put you on the air compressors. It's deep, all right. How long will you be down? Oh, something like an hour and a half, figuring we spend 30 minutes maximum at 160 feet odd. Well, it'll take 45 minutes staging out on the way up to beat the bends. Okay, don't push anything. We've got all the time and most of the money in the world. I have a syndicate backing me. Now, be careful. Our middle names. Ready to go, Cobb? a ladder from the scuppers and hit the water. I went down fast because I was heavily weighted. And going this deep, you don't want to waste time. I used the knotted guideline to help pull me down. The line was 175 feet long. It didn't reach all the way to the bottom. I stopped to consider what to do now. And then... I... I saw her for the first time. The damnedest sight I ever saw. The sight that was to change my whole life. What does a young man see in the ocean at nearly 30 fathoms deep that will change his life? And whatever it was, what does the term her mean? A female of some species? Or a female... Of these species, a woman. And if so, what kind of woman in the depths of the ocean? I'll return shortly with Act Two. Steve Carr has encountered whatever strange phenomenon has swum into his view far beneath the surface. His partner, Cobb Straker, has surfaced unexpectedly and now is being helped back aboard the ship. His relatively sudden reappearance has been a surprise to everyone aboard. And J.C. Hunter is the first to lend him a helping hand, reaching to take his fins as he shucks them in order to climb the ladder back aboard. You all right? Uh, sure. I came up because there's no point to the dive. What do you mean? Adams, take Mr. Straker's equipment. Help him out of the tanks. I don't know what your anchor hook snagged, but it must be some kind of a hill or mountain. Uh, what do you mean? Well, we've got 175 feet out of weighted guidelines, but mine at least still don't reach bottom. Once I got to the end of the line, I chickened out. I wasn't going any deeper on my own. And what about Steve? He's still down there. Well, maybe he's lucky. He hit a slope or something. I'll catch my second wind till he comes up. Maybe we can replot this whole dive better. Uh, how long will he be? Well, any minute now, unless he narked out. He what? Nitrogen narcosis. Raptures of the deep. A sort of deep sea drunk. Complete euphoria and you lose all track of time. He went down before me. Where the devil is he? Maybe you'd better go down after him. Well, if he doesn't break water in the next couple of minutes, I sure shoot him will. Oh, there he is. Well, where you been, Jerkola? What do you want to do? Give us all the hives? You all right? Huh. Just cutting it. You want to gaff me aboard, Cobb? Cobb. Did, did you go all the way down? Right to the end of the line. See anything? No. I just knew that any further and I was out of my depth. You, you didn't see her? Who? The girl. In the sort of flowing robes. She looked like an anemone, sort of. Well, maybe that's what you saw. Oh, no. This was no anemone. A sea animal, maybe. But if she was, she was the closest thing to the girl I dream about. And if that's where she lives, and man, let me live there, too. You know what I think, Steve. I think you were narked. No, no way, Cobb. My head was as clear as a bell. I'm going to tell you something right now, partner. I don't care about treasure ships. We stumbled on something far more special. If I can find her again. And right now I'm going over to see if I can. They couldn't talk me out of it. I asked for and got a longer guideline. 75 more feet took it to 250. Cobb was fit to be tied. 
I still think you're crazy, Steve. I'm going down with you. Oh, no, I want you up top on the line for signal so I know I'm safe. What's the big deal? 250 feet? Trying to set a record? Nowhere near it and you know it. Who was the guy who dived something near 400 breathing air? Some Italian, and they fished him up unconscious. I'm going nowhere near that. Now, wish me luck, buddy, because here I go. Now, wait a minute. I went down the guideline, hand over hand, like a circus flyer climbs to the trapeze platform. I wanted every minute I could have on the bottom, if I ever got there, or wherever I ran into her again, if I ever did. But outside of the beam from my torch... Everything was as black as being locked in a closet. Where is he, Cobb? Last signal he gave me was a 225. Fruithead, it's too deep for free diving. Signal him to come up. Well, what do you think I've been doing? I... Hold it. He just reached the end of the line. Well, at least he ain't going no further. I don't know how long I hung there. But at last I gave up. It was too dark to think of leaving the line, not without some ground underneath to read. I signaled I was on my way up. But before I could even start, they swam into the range of my light. I never saw anything like that. Man-shaped. Only they were scaled all over like fish. Not only did they wear foot fins, but their hands were the same. Their heads looked something like birds with a sort of beak and the face scaly, too. There were too many to count, and they swam as swiftly as dolphins. And in back of them was the girl. The girl I'd seen before. In the flowing robe and the swirling hair. I had time only to send an urgent signal up the line before they swarmed over me. What is it, Cobb? I don't know. Alarm signal. Something's wrong. I'm going over and down there. Stand by the line. Keep your hand on it. One jerk means everything's Jake. Two steady jerks, repeat it, means we're on our way up by stages. Three sharp jerks, repeat it or not, means you better have the decompression tank ready when we pop out like corks. You got it? I have it. What do you suppose he's running to down there? J.C., there are so many mysteries in the black beneath that green cover. Who could even attempt to guess? Two of the scaly porpoise things grabbed me by the arms and tore me away from the line. They were incredibly powerful and I was helpless to resist. They started on a plunge deeper into the ocean on the command of one of them who seemed to be in charge. It was then my guardian angel acted, stopping them imperiously. Suddenly, in my confused state, I realized they were speaking to each other quite freely. I could hear the sound of their voices and the words... But even more unbelievable, I could half understand them. They were speaking a strange, old-fashioned kind of Greek. No, Stanislaus, you cannot take him deeper. He has invaded our territory. He must be brought to my nucleus. These are my orders. Not as he is. He cannot stand the pressures. We must have an air tank. It will meet us on the way. I hope it's not too late. I don't think he has much air left. He'll manage. He'll have to. Couldn't we wait for the tank? I tell you, he may die. Let him. He is the enemy. If we can take them alive very well, if dead, what's the difference? At least let me escort him. I order you, let him go. He is my prisoner. I was in a daze. My mind suspended in shock as my body tried to take these huge depths. How was it possible these strange entities could speak to each other freely? Then I thought of fish. And more than that, dolphins and whales who communicate without problem. I wanted to pull the mouthpiece out and try to speak myself. But I knew I was not adapted for that. But most of all, I was amazed that by the accident of birth, I had the ability to understand these creatures and the arcane Greek that they spoke. The only terror was that I could tell the air in my tanks was running out. 
What happened, Cobb? Oh, search me. He's gone. There's no sign of him. Gone where? I don't know. Knocked, I guess. Raptures of the deep. We've got to fight it all the time we go deep enough. Oh, you think we've we've lost him? Oh, not in my book. I wouldn't have come up except I ran out of air. Get me in the tank. Decompress me. I came up too fast, but I'm going down again. First chance I get. I don't want to lose you too, Cobb. We haven't lost anyone. My buddy Steve is down there. All he needs is help. We were going deeper and deeper. And I could feel the terrible pressure of the water. I wanted to scream out my protest to the lovely woman who swam, if, if that's what we were doing beside me. But to relinquish my mouthpiece would have meant instant drowning. Which suddenly I faced. With the slightest of gurgles, my tanks were exhausted. And I spat out the mouthpiece and tried to say, help. It was as if my word had been articulated. For in a moment, her mouth was on mine. And she was breathing pure oxygen into my lungs. And in that moment, I saw some of the fish people swimming up towards me with a cylindrical tank just before I blacked out. When I came to, I was lying on a kind of couch on the inside of the tank. And beside me was the girl, woman, the apparition or whatever she was. The tank was transparent, and outside, like the men at the oars of some ancient slave ship, I could see we were being propelled by the fish things. I took a deep breath. A breath of delirious satisfaction and gratefulness. Whatever was ahead of me, at least I was breathing air again. As I did so, she opened her eyes and looked into mine. You are all right? I... I guess so. You can breathe? Or shall we adjust the pressure? No. No, it's fine. Just fine. Who are you? I am a halfway and in group one. My name is Ariadne. And yours? The name is Steve. Steve Carr. Steve Carr. It is a strange name. And you are a stranger... Yet you speak our language. Oh, well, not quite. It's close to my family tongue. You see, my real name is Stephanos Karalis. I'm Greek. Ah, oh, Greek. I have heard legends of them. They are a people who borrowed our language. Beg pardon? They came in ships, so the great book says. But we drove them off and sank them in the sea. But some, it is recorded, escaped. And they stole our language and our culture. What culture? The one you are being brought home to. Oh, how I hope you can survive. Don't worry, I'll make the attempt. But what am I going to survive to enjoy? You do not like me. Lady, that's beside the point at the moment. Where the devil are you taking me? To my home. And the home of my father's. To my country. To Atlantis. One of the world's prime mysteries. Is it possible that here is the answer to that mythical island of Atlantis that was, in ancient times, believed to have existed in the Atlantic Ocean? Could someone in our modern times actually have found his way to that fabled land? I shall return shortly with Act Three. island of Atlantis was first mentioned by Plato, the Greek philosopher. Later, in the first century before Christ, Solon, the father of law, reported that he was told of it by an Egyptian priest who said that it had been overwhelmed by an earthquake or a shifting in the world's crust, that it had sunk in the sea 9,000 years before his time. This is only one of many legends of the lost Atlantis including the one you are listening to in my present report. I 
remember being propelled by the strange creatures through a thick, waving forest of kelp. The great undulating trunks, perhaps some two to three feet across, and reaching up from the ocean bed into infinity. From then on, everything was blank until Ariadne woke me up. You can come out of the cylinder with me now, Stephanos. Where are we? On the floor of the ocean. Oh, no. No, Ariadne, I... I have no air. I, I can't breathe. You will have air. How? Did you fill my tanks? No need of that. You will be able to breathe now. No, no, you don't understand. I, I can't breathe underwater like you people. Oh, but halfways like me can only breathe for a limited time. Only the androcytes are adapted fully to breathe underwater. The androcytes? The, the men fish? You see, they are no longer here. Where is here? In the home place. The island under the sea. I looked through the transparent sides of the cylinder. And I couldn't believe it. A whole city covered the top of this giant floating island on the floor of the ocean. People were walking freely, chatting. The women dressed in flowing garments. The men in kilted skirts, their feet in sandals. I was back in the midst of a civilization older than Christianity and the Romans. Heaven only knows how many thousands of feet below the surface of the Atlantic. Ariadne now took me by the hand, and together we slipped out of the door that served as entrance or egress from the cylinder. Don't look so terrified, Stephanos. There's plenty of oxygen. Try. <sighs> hey... Well, all right. That's, that's beautiful, but, but where does it come from? I will let Minocles give what answers he deems proper to your questions. Who is Minocles? He is the ruler, the autocrat, the only one of which there is but one. Come, we must make haste. It is not good to keep him waiting. have brought the outsider, Minocles, as you commanded. Bring him forward that we may talk. Welcome to Atlantis. What is his name? Stephanos. He is Greek? I know of Greece. You came in your ships and we sank them. When was this, sir? Time for us is different than it is for you. In your terms, let us say in centuries, perhaps 12,000 of them ago. 12,000? More or less. Before the sea closed the waters of its doors above our heads and we became the lost Atlantis. What happened, sir? You may call me Minocles. I do not know this other word. W was it an earthquake? At the end, yes. A convulsion of the earth that plunged us forever beneath the water. But how could you have lived? We had our warnings. Oh, yes, we were warned. How? In the second passage of the seasons after I was named as autocrat, two significant discoveries were made which were to preserve us even in the face of disaster. One was that our island had begun to sink slowly and that our civilization was doomed unless we could prepare to adapt. Come with me. Once I could look from these heights across Atlantis to the sun setting on a sea that stretched beyond the wall about our island. The wall? You see? Stone piled on stone and sealed stone to stone to shut out the encroaching waters. Like Holland and the dikes. What do you say? Just another people who had to shut out the sea. Like us? No, no, not like you. They never sank into it. What did you do when that happened? First the wall, and then the dome. I... I don't understand. Look up, Stephanos. From the top of the wall, arching above us, we are sealed in one huge envelope. 
A giant sort of plastic bubble. You live in the opposite of a goldfish bowl. A world of our own. Within this protected area, we manufacture the breath of life. How? By pumps, which extract the oxygen from the sea, very much as fish gills do. But how long did this take to build? We had a thousand times the wheeling of the seasons. A thousand years? Long enough to be ready for the convulsion that cast us to the bottom of the sea. How do you live? What do you feed yourselves? We had to adapt a breed, a phylum, which could cultivate our sea farms outside the protection of this, uh, what you call, bubble. The androcytes. Exactly. Simply a matter of selective breeding to reverse the process of man's rise to land from the mother sea. You mean they breathe like fish through gills and no longer can sustain life on air? Exactly. But why would they work for you? Couldn't they abandon you and make their own state? No. Why? Because they cannot reproduce. The secret of parthenogenesis. No man or woman or creature that you have encountered in our society was born. He, she, it was created spontaneously. The fabric built from some living cell taken from another. Cloning? What is that word? Uh, it, it means taking a cell from any given body, man or woman, then introducing it into the ova of a woman from whom part of the nucleus has been removed and producing, after full term, a mirror image of the person from whom the cell was taken. Substantially correct. But that's a recent discovery. In your world, perhaps. It was a technique we perfected nearly 600 generations ago. You must learn to live with it. What does that mean? You are a fresh impetus for us. You bring new ideas and knowledge of wider horizons. Since you are to be with us, we must have you duplicated as soon as possible. My protests were waved away by the imperious Minocles. And in spite of Ariadne's attempts to calm me down, I was finally dragged away by a swarm of guards. The prison room in which I was confined was classic. And its dampness worried me because it brought back too vividly the immense pressure of the sea all about this relatively tiny bubble of air in the midst of the vast oceans of the sea. I don't know how she managed it, but Ariadne came to me. Ariadne. Shh. Not so loud. H how did you get here? I have privileges. I am a halfway, but there is royal blood in my veins. What are we going to do? Do? I can't fit in here. How can I? You can. After the operation tomorrow, you will go to adaptation training and become a halfway like me. And you will be reproduced. What operation? To sterilize you. To what? <laughs> I won't let them. But why not? If you are to be among us, we cannot have someone who can reproduce at will. It would tear apart the whole fabric of our lives. I don't want to do that. I, I can't be part of what you are, Ariadne. What else can you do? I can go back. Back where I came from. The autocrat would never allow you to do that. Then you must help me escape. How? It is impossible. You are not adapted. How could you breathe long enough out there? Fill my tanks with enough air. But you could not stand the pressures. Then we'll have to steal a cylinder like the one you brought me here in. Impossible. Even if I did, the androcytes would capture us. And we have no way to move it. You say you are adapted. You could move us up high enough so that I could come out safely. There is only one chance. I must help you escape. The details of the escape don't matter. Somehow we got away and started up towards the surface. And we're lucky enough, for Ariadne was smart enough, that we didn't encounter any of the fishmen. Unerringly, she led me back to the spot I had left. How long ago? And there was my weighted rope. It's knots climbing towards the surface 
and my world. I had my arm about her waist, but suddenly she squirmed free, and she spoke to me while I was helpless to answer. Goodbye, Stephanos. I wish I had been born as you were. But we are from different worlds, and there is no bridge between them. Only let me say one thing. I have something to take away with me which makes me different. Makes me an individual in a world where such a thing does not exist. I am glad I knew that, even if only briefly. Goodbye, Stephanos. She darted away from me so fast I couldn't follow. Her loose robes billowing like a flower. I couldn't have followed her anyway. Because suddenly the androcytes were all about seizing her and dragging her down. Some of them came for me. And I had no choice but to drop my heavily weighted belt and shoot to the surface in a haze of bubbles. Exploded out of the ocean as if I'd been a champagne cork. Cobb! Cobb! There he is! It's Steve! He came up without being decompressed. Get that chamber ready. Okay, Steve. Take it easy. No. No, I've got to follow her. To save... Where am I? You're in the hospital, Steve. And I'm your buddy. Cobb Straker. And you just about copped it, friend. I... I've got to get back. I've got to get back. Steve, you ain't going nowhere. Not if I have to sit on you till you come out of all of this. But Ariadne... The dame, sure. Lost Atlantis, sure. You gotta be kidding, man. Steve, sooner or later, you've got to face up to it. You zonked out down there. You were narked. The raptures of the deep. You said it, Steve, not me. But that's all it was. It's what I've had to settle for. Leave it at that or end in a funny farm. But the memory of it and of a girl named Ariadne. Her hair and her loose garments stirred by the water as if they were the petals of a sea flower will haunt me all my life. We never did find J. Calvin Hunter's treasure, but I found my own. I only wish I could have kept it. unforgettable story which I find haunts me too not only the girl but that strange and beautiful city state that Steve also imagined or visited briefly the legend of Atlantis dies hard could one imagine that it still does exist buried somewhere so deep in the Atlantic East trough that man has as yet no way to find the way there I'll be back shortly. Did you know that Goodyear services cars? I didn't know that. Lots of people don't. Say Goodyear, they'll say tires almost every time. Good for them. Yeah, well, how do we tell them Goodyear services cars? Why don't we tell them about the limited warranty? The what? Tell everyone that if you get your car serviced at Goodyear, yeah. the service and parts are backed by Goodyear with a warranty good for 90 days or 3,000 miles. Oh, which? Whichever comes first. Oh. And if the work isn't done right, yeah. and you're more than 50 miles from where you got it serviced, you can take your car to any of over 1,500 Goodyear service stores, yeah. and they'll redo it at no charge. So that's a great deal. Yep. Look, I thought you said you didn't know Goodyear services cars. I didn't. I must have read it somewhere. Well, where would you read that? Probably my warranty. Oh, yeah. Smooth out your rough running engine with a tune-up at your Goodyear service store for just thirty nine eighty eight for six-cylinder cars. Includes new points, plugs, rotor, and condenser. No extra charge for air conditioning or labor. Call for an appointment now. Price is slightly higher in California. Recently, I read that Steve and Cobb had traced the drifting of a long-sunk Spanish galleon and that all along the path had come up with gold and artifacts worth a king's ransom. 
I'm glad Steve struck it rich. I hope he enjoys his hard-bought wealth. I wonder if he would exchange it for that other treasure he found. Or thought he found. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Catherine Byers, Ray Owens, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Who's Marla? You wouldn't understand. You could explain it. You wouldn't believe it. Look, your name is Howard Spurlow. I know my name. You are about to be tried for murder. I know that, too. I'm the attorney appointed to defend you. We've been through all this. Why don't you let me alone? You have to have a defense. Why? Why did you kill him? It doesn't matter. It does matter. Premeditated murder, first degree, puts you in jail for life. I don't care. You don't care now, Wade. This state of shock you're in will wear off. You don't care. I wish you'd let me alone. On the other hand, second degree or manslaughter or lesser charges, you could get a maximum of ten years. Maybe as low as three or four. Tell me, why did you kill him? Why don't you let me alone? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.